Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. I'm glad you're here. Glad I'm here. All right. Well, let's start in prayer. I'm going to pray out of Ephesians 1, verse 15. Father God, we come before you. We thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for the strong faith in the people of True North Church. Their strong faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for their love for God's people everywhere. Father, I have not stopped thanking God for them. Lord, we lift each person up here constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give us spiritual wisdom and insight so that we may grow in our knowledge of you. We pray that our hearts be flooded with light so that we can understand the confident hope you have given us that you've called. You've called us, Lord. You've called us. We're your called people, your chosen people with a plan and with a purpose. And Father God, we thank you that you reveal that we understand that confident hope and that calling that you have on our lives. Your holy people who are rich. You are, we are your rich and glorious inheritance. Father God, we pray also that we will understand the incredible greatness of your power to us who believe. The same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. And God's put all things under the authority of Christ, made him the head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is your body. And it is made full and complete by Christ, who fills everywhere with himself. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord. And children, you are dismissed. Okay, this morning, the message that we are sharing, yes, we are praying over our, handing out our, let's see, could we pass those around? We're praying, these are prayer cloths that we're praying over, so if you would just pray over those as, as we study the word today. Today, our message is called, I am a seed. I am a seed. I don't know if you heard about the man that said, I used to hate when I accidentally ate seeds, but recently they've been growing on me. Do you know, do you know what the blonde man said when he looked into a box of Cheerios? Wow, donut seeds. I know, it couldn't be a blonde woman. Not from a girl preacher. Okay, so we've been studying the parable of the sower, and I believe that's where God wants us to continue to be this morning. Uh, we've learned that God's word is the seed in the parable of the sower. There was one kind of seed, and God's word was the seed. First Peter 1.23 says, For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but we have been born again of seed that is imperishable. That is the living, enduring word of God. We have been born again by the living seed, the living word of God. We've learned that our seed does not expire. The seed of God's word does not expire. It does not grow old. It does not become outdated. We don't have to throw it out. It never loses its influence or its effect. It is living, imperishable seed. Amen. In, let's look in uh, John 15, John 15, 5. We've learned that it is God's will that we bear much fruit. In case you were wondering what God's will for you, one of the things that his will for you, he has a plan and purpose for you. We want to help you to find that calling of God on your life, that you walk out those things that God designed for you and created for you. And part of that is that you bear much fruit. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, Jesus is speaking. I am the vine and you are the branches, the one who remains in me. And I in him, 
bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So whatever we do, apart from Jesus, Jesus said, the value, nothing. Apart from me, anything we're doing apart from him, he said, it's nothing. Verse 8, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples. So when we are fruit bearers, we glorify the father. That is what we were created for, to bring glory to the father. And we've studied last time that I taught, we studied the law of sowing and reaping. I call it a law because it is a law. You know, God put certain parameters on this earth that work whether we are aware of them or not. The law of gravity, you you don't even have to have heard of it, and it is working in your life. Thermodynamics, they're working in the world around you and in your life, even if you're like, I don't even know what that is. Uh, The law of diminishing return, there's, there's certain laws that are in effect, and one of those laws is the law of sowing and reaping. And we'll be wise if we understand these laws and get them into effect in our lives. So we're gonna start in Galatians 6, 7. Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived, Do not be deceived. Don't be led astray. Don't be led off course. Don't be affected by someone else's outside influence and lead you in the wrong direction. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh, uh, the Amplified says his sinful capacity, his worldliness, his disgraceful influences, impulses. The one who sows to his own flesh will reap destruction of the flesh. Okay, when we sow to the flesh, we reap destruction. But the one who sows to the spirit will reap eternal life from the spirit. When we sow to the spirit, we reap life. When we sow to the flesh, we reap death and destruction. Verse 9, let us not become discouraged in doing good. Let us not become discouraged in doing good. Do you know we have to encourage one another? Don't get discouraged in doing good because we want to get weary and give up. We get tired and we look at the circumstances and we're not seeing what we want to see and we want to quit. Don't get discouraged in doing good. Don't get discouraged in standing on your faith, meditating the word, speaking the word over that situation that you're wanting to see changed. Maybe you haven't, maybe you haven't moved the needle yet. Don't get discouraged in doing good. For in due time, we will reap if we do not become weary. So do not be mocked. Whatsoever a person sows, this will he reap. So, the word sow there is in the Greek is spiro. It refers to any seed that is sown. It's applicable to anything in life. In context, Paul's talking about money. It applies to money. And we see Paul use that reference again and again. But the, the actual seed, it can be any seed sown. It can be love, work, time, patience, kindness, forgiveness, bitterness, selfishness. Whatsoever emphasizes whatever thing, regardless of what. And the Greek tense, both for the sowing and the reaping, translate to a constant, steady, perpetual action. It depicts a manner of lifestyle. So this law of sowing and reaping is at work in your life right now. It's been working. It didn't start just the moment when you heard about it. It's been working. Sowing and reaping is working. So if you don't like what you see, then you've been sowing something you didn't want. So we want to check up on what we're sowing. All right, so today we are going to look at different seeds. In in the parable of the sower, we only had good seed. Uh, We had the seed was the word of God, and there was only good seed. 
But as we go on down to the next parable, Jesus, you know, Jesus gave us these parables because he wanted us to know what it's like living in the kingdom. Because we would be living in the kingdom. Because we live as born-again children of God, we live in the kingdom. We've been translated out of a kingdom of darkness, and we have a whole different address. We live in a whole different kingdom now, and he wants you to know. Now listen, that kingdom that you were born into on this earth, my kingdom's different. So you're going to have to learn the rules of my kingdom. And so he gives us another parable. In in Matthew 13, verse 24, we have the parable of the weeds among the wheat. Matthew 13, 24. This is coming on down. We've been in Matthew 13. And this is a, a supplement to the parable of the sower. Jesus presented them another parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like this. Now, I told you all that, and we've studied all that. Okay, now I've got a new idea. The kingdom of heaven is like this. It's like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and left. And when the wheat sprouted and produced grain, then the weeds also became evident. And the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Then how does it have weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No. While you are gathering up the weeds you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And at, that, and at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the weeds and bind them in bundles to burn them, then gather the wheat into my barn. So this is called the parable of the weeds among wheat. The King James calls it uh, the tares among wheat. So in in this parable, we've got two different kinds of seed, different from the parable of the sower. We have good seed, and we have bad seed. And we also have two sowers, don't we? Two are sowing. We've got got the farmers sowing, and we have an enemy sower. Now, if we go in down to Matthew 13, 36, the, the disciples came to Jesus and asked him to explain this parable. So starting in 36, then, then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. And he said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. Remember, we learned in the parable of the sower that that the farmer just cast that seed on every kind of ground. So so the seed is the world, and the son of man sowed the whole world. You know, the son of man, Jesus created the world. It was his design. It was his, his creation. And then when Adam lost the dominion of the world, Jesus bought it back with his life, with his precious blood. So, so he has a right to sow that field. It, it, it belongs to him. He bought it back. So, so the, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. For as the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. And the weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. So just as the weeds are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks, all those who commit lawlessness, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteousness 
then the righteous will shine forth like the sun in the kingdom of their father. The one who has ears, let him hear. All right, so, so the good seed that Jesus shows is, did you know all seed is potential, right? All seed, it, it's worth, uh, the potential in a seed is much, much greater than the seed itself. So the potential that the seed that Jesus is, it's potential to save the whole world. He saved the whole world. He paid the price for the whole world. There's no reason for one person to die and go to hell. There's no reason. There's no, no sin too great because the price has been paid. He's bought back the whole world, and that's the gospel message. But that's only half the story, right? That's God's half of the story. That's for whosoever will. All right, so, so that Christ, he, he sowed in this field. He sows in the world the good seeds that become the children of the kingdom. So in the parable of the sower, we were talking about us being the ground, right? And we're planting seeds. In the parable of, of the weeds, we are the seed. We are the seed. You know, it reminds me how Jesus came and he taught and he said, I am the light of the world, right? And then there came a time when he said, you are the light of the world. So Jesus was the seed. Jesus was the first seed. He said when he was telling that his time was come, we read this Wednesday night in, in, our, in our small group. Uh, when his time was coming, when we were getting close to his time and he was explaining it to his disciples, he said, he said unless a, unless a, unless a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it can't do what it's supposed to do. He was saying, I'm, I'm going to give my life as a seed. And look at, the, look at the effect of his seed. So now we are the seed. All right, so we notice in, in this parable that the world is a divided kingdom. There are two sowers. The first sower sowed in the daytime, right? The second sower sowed at night. The, the evil one, Jesus said it's the devil. His work is done stealthily. His desire is to conceal himself so that you don't recognize that it's him sowing seed. This is a mark of Satan's strategy to keep men from discovering his identity. And what you hear very often when Satan's done something, people say, I don't know why God did that. That means he was stealth and people didn't see it. All right, it also says, so we, we, we have a divided kingdom. We've got two sowers. We've got a sower that sows in the daylight and we've got a sower that sows in the darkness. And we also have, Jesus said that uh, his men, let's see. Sorry. He says that his men slept. His men slept. While his men were sleeping, what verse is that? Who can help me? Not too many of you guys can help me. Thank you, Liliana. But while his men were sleeping, verse 25, while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and left. So this isn't talking about physical sleep. His men were at fault here. While his men were sleeping, when they, weren't, when they should have been on guard, when they should have been watching, the enemy came and sowed seeds, sowed evil, sowed evil seeds. So, so uh, they should have kept watch. They should have kept watch. It's important that whatever we have watch over, that we're keeping watch over what's, what God's given us to tend the things that God's given us to tend, we need to keep watch. We don't want to be sleeping and give the enemy a place. All right, 1 John 3.10. 1 John 3.10. Hey, by the way, good job being at church today. 
I know sometimes that this is a hard day after you've had a whole week of being slammed into a new time zone. Uh, you, you did good to be at church today. First John 3.10 says, By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Two kingdoms. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother and sister. I love this. I love that John says, you know, he kind of makes it easy on us. He said, we've got to practice righteousness. Means we're not going to get it right every time. Righteousness is who we are in Christ Jesus. It means I'm, I'm interested in what does God have to say about the situation. Righteousness means uh, who does God say I am and how do I apply that in my life? What does the word of God have to say about this? So those who practice righteousness are of the children of God and those who do not, it's, he says it's obvious it's obvious who the children of God are and the children of the devil. He said, we've got to practice righteousness and have love for his brother and sister. This is what Pastor Brad's been speaking on the last two weeks. The love manifesting in us through us for one another. All right, so Satan is a counterfeiter. He always comes on the heels of God and makes a counterfeit. He is not an originator. He's not original. He doesn't have an original thought. He's just a perverter. Okay, so he, he sows a false wheat. He, uh, he counterfeits the wheat. He comes along. Uh, and if we look through time, we look in the Old Testament, God sent prophets. Satan counterfeited with false prophets. After, after the Father God sent Christ, he counterfeited with the Antichrist that's been in the world since Jesus. After Jesus said in the apostles, he raised up false apostles. There's true ministers of the gospel, false ministers of the gospel. There's true Christians and false Christians. Of the 12, it was Judas. In the church of Jerusalem, it was Ananias and Sapphira. At the church of Samaria, there was Simon Magus who... The word says, in the gall of bitterness, in the bond of iniquity. In the church of Ephesus, Paul said there was wolves in sheep's clothing. And in the church of, of Pergamos, there was the Balaamites and the Nicolaitans. So why does God permit wickedness? Why does he permit that? He made us as free moral agents, free to accept or reject he paid the price for the whole world, but then he, he made the decision ours. And every decision, uh, every decision has consequences. In this world, everything that goes on around about us is not the hand of God. The hand of God has kept us from destroying ourselves already. The only reason we're still alive is because of the hand of God. But the, a lot of the things that you see around you are the result of people making decisions that were ungodly that have consequences. So we're free or moral agents. So the servants wanted to get rid of the tares. They wanted to, uh, uh, to use violence. Do you remember when James and John, when the Samaritans respect, uh, uh, rejected Christ, and James and John said, hey, master, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? Yeah, you got to love them. Uh, and, and, and the master gave the directions. He said, we can't separate them now. They're going to have to grow up together. So because some weeds look like the children of God, and some children of God look like weeds. So we are going to actually become the good seed as we practice righteousness. So how do we practice righteousness? We've got to change our thought patterns, change our attitudes. We're in a new kingdom that thinks differently, talks differently, acts differently, has a different source and a different supply, and we have to act like it. All right, so we're going to change how we talk over our situations. We're going to change our attitudes. This is planting. This is, uh, this is planting the good seed in our lives. 
That this is planting the good seed around us. But do you know what Satan has? He has the anti-seed. He has the anti-seed. So he says, you are, you are, what matters is the color of your skin or what country you were born in or what education you have. He's telling you uh, all of these things that matter and, and what it is is you're not enough in every situation. You're the wrong thing. His seed is always doubt and unbelief. It's always incapability, impossibility, and the good seed is all things are possible to him who believes. Nothing is impossible. All things have been granted for life and godliness. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm the lender and not the bar. This is what the good seed says. Very, very contrasting to the anti-seed. All right. So where we are in life is a reflection of what have we been sowing. My sowing got me to the point that I'm at. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson was a, a pastor and a, and a poet. He said, sow a thought and you reap an action. Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. Your destiny is tied directly to and starts with your thoughts. And that is scriptural. Okay, so let's look at it from a little bit of a practical uh, perspective uh, this morning. So we're going to start by sowing one seed at a time. Focus on what needs my attention today. That means I think that older people have a tendency to look back and be discouraged. And I think young people have a tendency to look way out here and be really anxious. And I guess people like me in the middle are like both ways, right? <laughs> All right, so what, what needs my attention today, I'm going to start sowing the seeds of the harvest that I want to reap. One thing that we have to do to change our harvest is to stop thinking certain negative thoughts. Negative thoughts feed on each other. Every thought is a seed. And I want you to remember the ability of this seed to multiply and reproduce. That's what they were created to do. When we think negative thoughts, we breed negative thoughts. Um, I heard something interesting this week that there, in, in our brain we have something called the reticular activating system. And it acts as a filter to our thoughts because there is so much information. When you think about all the possible input in a moment... When you think about, you know, you have input through your eyes and through your ears, through the smells, um, the things that you feel, uh, the things that you see, and the memories, all the possible connections with any moment in time, your brain, it's too much. And your brain can't take it all in. It's like, there's no way you can take all that in. And so it has to filter it. So what your brain does, your, your reticular activating system looks for, well, I know what we like. We like things that are familiar. Uh, anything that proves the negative thoughts that I've been thinking, that's what I'm going to zero in on. Well, you know, when she said that to me, she probably thought this about me and, and, and meant this and, and thought this. We just immediately, whatever we're used to thinking is what we zero in on. An example is like when you get a new car and... Um, you know, a different kind of car than you've had before. And we just, we just bought a new um, Outback. It's not new, but, but we bought a Subaru Outback. And so now all of a sudden, do you know what's everywhere? Subaru Outbacks are everywhere. Well, it's not like everybody went and bought one the same day we did. It's just all of a sudden we notice them because we're tuned into them because we're, we, we bought one, right? So it's like now all of a sudden when we weren't paying attention to that, we noticed that. When you think about, um, you know, I've talked about how, how Jonah is a birder. And like if you go walk with him and you can be talking about something and then he's like, 
And he hears some bird, maybe some rare bird. He hears some bird song because he's clued into that and he's listening for that. And how many times, I bet you have no clue how many times you've walked through bird song and didn't even hear it. But it was happening. So our reticular activating system filters according to what's familiar and the habits we've already created and and that we are drawing to ourselves. Does that make sense? We're drawing. If we are in the habit of thinking negative thoughts, then that's what we're drawn to. And we're multiplying negative thoughts. So we have to, we, it acts as a filter to attract like thoughts. So uh, we can prove any idea that we want to prove with that. Because we ignore the information that we want to ignore. And we recognize the information we want to recognize and prove however wrongly whatever we want to prove. Okay? So we have to retrain our brain to think God's thoughts. We have to retrain our brain to think God's thoughts. And then we build in our brain. Our brain has plasticity. And we build new pathways. Our brain is so phenomenal. It's so phenomenal what it's capable of. At any age in life, you can change those patterns. You can change those thought patterns. You can change those habits. Okay, so most actions spring from thoughts we are unconscious of. Most actions spring from thoughts that we've opened the door to an idea and we let it take root inside of us. We have between 12,000 and 60,000 thoughts a day. Between 12,000 and 60,000 thoughts a day. 85% are negative. 90% are repetitive. We just think the same thoughts. We get stuck on the same old thing. Over and over and over. I was irritated about this yesterday. I'm irritated about it today. And I'm going to be irritated about it tomorrow. Yeah. We have to change our thoughts. Change those patterns. Did you know, it's just amazing that, that as you study science, and, and a lot of these things are like brand new in science, they are in the word of God. The word, is God, the word of God is timeless. It will carry you through. The law of sowing and reaping is just what you need for the end times. The word of God is just what you need to be living right now. The love of God and growing in the love of God is just the thing. Just the thing for where you are and what you're going through. All right, so one way that we can change, we have, to, we have to become aware it's called metacognition. We have to start to pay attention to how we're thinking. That means we're thinking about our thinking. Uh, and this is like the, the elementary level of sowing and reaping, but it's going to start in our thoughts. So we have to renew our mind to the word of God and get a better thought. You can't just stop thinking something. You have to replace it with a different thought. You remember with, uh, when they cast the, the devil out? Was it the one that was legion that they cast out? And then he came back, and, or maybe it wasn't that one, but he came back and brought seven more with him because it was swept clean? Yeah, we don't want to be swept clean. We want to be full of the word of God. We've got to put some powerful seed in us. We've got to put some imperishable seed in us. We've got to be planting and growing a harvest in us. We're not swept clean. We're not emptying our mind. Okay, we're meditating on the word of God and letting it grow and take root in us. So, and as we do this, science shows it actually changes our physical brain. Our physical brain on an MRI looks different. It looks different for a person of gratitude. 
They say that people that have gone through trauma, when they uh, reenact that trauma in their mind on an MRI, it lights up just like they were going through it with the first time. And it may have been 30, 50 years ago. Your brain doesn't know the difference in time as you reenact that trauma. So, one thing that we have to do is look for what we're grateful for. We have to start looking for what we're thankful for. Yes, gas prices are high, but what am I thankful for? I'm thankful that I have a car. I, told, I, I tell you things they told us in China. They were like, they think we're rich because we have cars. They don't have cars, and if you have a car, you only get to drive it certain days of the week according to when the government, what your license plate says. You don't get to drive anytime, anywhere you want to. You're limited to where you can drive and what days by what the numbers are on your license plate. I'm glad I get to drive wherever I want. I can put gas money in my car, and I can go places. Okay, so we've got to start to find things that we're thankful for. And as we make that a habit, guess what? We start to change what we're attracted to. We start changing that pattern of attraction. And we'll start building proof for something positive instead of building proof for something negative. You know, um, how people do when they, they look up some sort of ailment on Google, right? And they start seeing it and they're like, oh, no, and they see all these bad things. And then they start, yeah, I think I have that. I think, yes. And they start building this case. Well, as we start to change the way we're thinking, we'll be building a different case, creating a different story, okay? So if we need to invest in, in, our, in our marriage, then we have to notice and appreciate the good. We all get irritated with our mates if you're married. But what we have to do is if you start getting irritated, then one, one irritating thing, if, if you let it and you hold on to that and you accept that, then the devil will come along, well, you know what else? And you'll start building a case for, you know what, he really is annoying. Yeah, or... You could start building a case for, he's amazing. He's so kind and so giving and so generous. So we start looking. We change what we're focusing on, okay? So, so if we're wanting to change what we're sowing, if we want to change what we're reaping, then we're going we're gonna to guard our mouth and we're going to speak encouraging words. And we're going to think the best. We're going to believe the best. We're going to put them first and prefer them without expecting an immediate return. Sometimes we're like, I did this and I was really expecting a return on that. Right? No. We're sowing. We're sowing and we we may not see an immediate return, but we know the law of sowing and reaping, and we know we put it into effect, and we know we put that seed in the ground. Remember, it said the sowing and the reaping was a continual, a continual, a continual, and in due season, you're going to reap your return. Okay, so over your children. Speak life over your children. Speak, speak good things over your children. Let your words point them in the right direction. I love the NLT. I think it's Proverbs says, point your children in the way they should go. And when they're old, they won't get lost. So speak the direction. Let your words be directionary. Let your words be creative. Let your words be pointed in the direction that you want to go. Your words are powerful. Okay, let's see. All right, let's look what God wants us to do as we wrap up here. Let's look at Malachi 3.10. We've looked at this. So we're going to look at it again. Malachi 
So it says, bring the whole tithe. This is an example. I said that one thing that we can sow and, and, and uh, work the law of, of sowing and reaping is money because the Bible says so. So here's one example. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. The storehouse is the church so that there'll be food in my house and put me to the test now in this. So sometimes we think, oh, you can't test God. He says, put me to the test and see what I'll do. He says, and here's what I'll do. Let me tell you what I'll do. If I do not open for you the window of heaven and pour out a blessing until it overflows. I will pour out a blessing until it overflows. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor will the vine in the field prove fruitless to you. Now remember, Jesus said, it's my desire. It brings glory to the Father when you bear much fruit. But see, now he's mentioned, there's a devourer who wants to come and devour that seed that you've sown and that, that harvest that comes in. He said, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruit of your ground. So now, now he's come alongside you and he's a protection for us against the devourer after our fruit is already coming into harvest, says the Lord, says, says the Lord of armies. So in, in this example, he's speaking to an agrarian culture. And the thing that they are sowing uh, first is seeds in the ground. They're plowing the ground and they're planting seeds. They are an agrarian culture, okay? So the first thing that has to happen is they have to do the work. They have to put the seed in the ground. They have to plow up the field and, and put the seed. So there is a natural uh, thing that has to happen. And then they sow the tithe. The tithe is uh, the tenth, and the tithe is the part, is, is the spiritual part that they're recognizing giving to God. So we instigate this process. We are the instigators. So he says, test me in it and see if I won't pour out a blessing till it overflows. In Luke 6, 38, he says, whatever measure you use, I'll give it back to you, but when I give it back to you, it'll be overflowing. He's an overflowing God. He said, but I'll use the measure that you use. If you use a cup, I'll give you an overflowing cup. If you use a five-gallon bucket, I'll return it with an overflowing five-gallon bucket. Uh, our people worked hard <laughs> putting the rocks out. And we had, I mean, it was efficient. Uh, they were filling up the ones that could fill up buckets of rocks and then the bigger ones carried the rocks or pushed the uh, whole wheelbarrow full of rocks. Yeah, but if you use a wheelbarrow, he says, I'll use that wheelbarrow, but it will be overflowing. If you use a dump truck, I'll use a dump truck, but it'll be overflowing. So the same measure that you use is what I'm going to use, and, and it's going to be overflowing. So God will prosper the seed zone. And God will rebuke the devourer in our lives. So it's a twofold blessing. So whatever area of lack you have, whatever area of need, we have to look at what we have to sow. And we actually have three things to sow. We have three things that we can sow. We can, these are our resources available to us. We have words. And we have time, and we have money. So whatever area that you're needing, you need to figure out, Lord, what am I supposed to be sowing? As we go on, we're gonna, we're, we'll have to stop this today. But we have resources, and we have time, and we have money. And the kingdom principles work contrary to the world system. The world system says when things get hard, when you have lack, then you better pull it in tighter. You better hold on. You better, you better hoard up. You better stock up. You better go get all your buckets full of gas. That's what the world system says to do. But God says, 
you got to give so that I can give it back to you. And I'm going to use the measure that you use, but I'm going to have it overflowing. All right. I think we'll stop there. Let's stand to our feet. So we are sowers. Everybody say, I'm a sower. You are a sower. I don't know if you know what you've been sowing, but you are a sower. I'm a sower and I'm a reaper. I'm a sower and I'm a reaper. This works for any age. This works for young people wanting to raise their money to go to youth camp. It starts, though, you've got to put a seed in the ground. It starts with you've got to get some seed in the ground. It doesn't just come to you. We initiate it with our sowing. So what resources do we have to sow? We've got words, we've got time, and we've got money. So if we're wanting to reap a harvest, we got to get some seed in the ground. So we're going to pick that up next week and keep going. God's word is good. All right, let's go to the Father. Lord, we love you. We praise you, Father God. We're so grateful to you. We're so grateful to you, Lord. We have so much to be grateful for. Father, we're so comfortable. Lord, we're so comfortable in every area of our life. We don't even hardly know discomfort. Father God, help us to see how blessed we are. Help us to see how you've poured out your blessings. Father God, help us to not become complacent and dissatisfied in our lives that you've blessed us so generously and so graciously, so extravagantly you've given to us. We're, we're so prosperous. We're so blessed. Father God, help us to see how we need to start giving our seed. We need to start, instead of just being, being people who just eat, who just take, who just, who just to take it into ourselves, that, Father God, we're sowers. You said that you give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, but we're not just eaters, Lord. We're sowers. We're sowers. We're putting our seed in the ground. We're casting our seed. We are the seed, the word tells us. We are the seed. We are your kingdom, and we are the seed. Father God, that, that we would go forth in every area of our life that you would stir us up where our thoughts are anti-seed. Where our thoughts are anti-seed, thoughts that have come along behind the word of God and said the opposite, help us to recognize when those thoughts are contrary to what you said first. Your word comes first. It was delivered first. It was received first. We give it first place in our lives and we'll not accept a counterfeit. We'll not accept a counterfeit. Father God, help us to see where we've been harboring ill thoughts. We've been harboring bitterness. We've been harboring wrong ideas that are not even true. That, Father God, we'll think your truth, whatever is lovely, whatever is excellent, whatever is true, whatever is worthy of praise, we'll think on these things. We'll think on these things. And, Father, if we need to set our watch to have a timer go off where we can sit and have a little metacognition and say, what am I thinking right now? What am I thinking right now? Help, help us to become aware of our thoughts, that we'll turn our thoughts to you, that we'll turn our thoughts to you. Father God, that, that we're prepared for your return. Just as John the Baptist came and prepared the way for you, and he, he, he encouraged people. He turned the, the, the father's thoughts back to their children. He, uh, repentance and everybody's thoughts turned back to you, ready to receive Jesus. Lord, we live in another time like that, that, are, that we're prepared to receive you, that we're prepared to be the seed, that we're prepared to be the light, that we're prepared to speak the truth into a lost and dying, confused and hurting world. 
That, Father God, that, that you stir up something bigger and something better in us and that we'll accomplish what you've called us to accomplish and we'll use our resources well. We'll speak your words. Everything else is nothing. Jesus said, I only speak what I hear. Lord, we don't want to be saying a bunch of nothing. Lord, our time, there's nothing that compares to spending our time for you. Lord, our our energy, our money. Father, there's nothing we could accumulate that would compare with being an investor in the kingdom of God. Thank you for showing us how to use the life that you've given us, the resources you've given us, Father. Lord, I ask you to stir every age. The lies that Satan would say, you're too young, you're too old, you're too this, you're too that. You're not enough this, you're not enough. Those are all anti-seed. And we reject that in the name of Jesus. We thank you. There's much for us to accomplish, much for us to do. We've been called and appointed and anointed. And we'll do it. We'll do it. We'll accomplish. We thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for it in advance. Lord, our words are shaping the path ahead of us. Our words are shaping the path of our marriage. The words are shaping the path of our children's lives. The words are shaping the path of our career and the favor that we find. Father God, I thank you that you quicken us. And help us. Thank you that you love us. Lord, find us practicing righteousness. Find us practicing righteousness. Thank you, Lord. Is there anybody that needs prayer this morning? We don't want to miss an opportunity. If you want to come down and receive prayer, we'll join in faith together. We worship you, Lord. Father, we commit our thoughts, the seeds of our thoughts. We commit the words of our mouth to you. We give it to you right now. Father God, we give you our time. We give you our money. Lord, not my money. It's your money. Oh, we give it all to you. We thank you. You show us how to be wise, how to sow it as you'd have us sow. Lord, we thank you that you watch over us. Every single person are coming and are going. Lord, I just speak health from the top of our top of our heads to the bottom of the soles of our feet. The protection of God, the angels go with us and, and lift us up lest we strike our foot against a stone. Father God, we thank you. We're under the shadow of your wings. Thank you that you're speaking to us, leading us, and guiding us, and we're thinking new thoughts, making new pathways in our brains this week. In Jesus' name, amen.